Hello, welcome to EPG Pathshala program in linguistics. I am Pramod Pandey, Center for Linguistics at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Today we will look at the module principles of phonemic analysis part 1. In the previous modules we introduced ourselves to the main assumptions and some of the important concepts of phonemic analysis. In the present module, we will look at the nature, the notion of the phoneme as considered in the literature. Before we go on to talk about the phonemic analysis principles, in the main, we are concerned with phoneme in three different ways. Number one, what kind of object a phoneme is. Number two, what is the nature of the content of a phoneme. And number three, how can we analyze the phonemic system of a language. So, we will consider the first two aspects of the phoneme and begin with the third aspect that is principles of phonemic analysis. To start with, the most important part of any phonemic analysis is what is known as the phonemic principle. The assumption that all languages have a limited number of speech sounds that contrast with one another and that differentiate words from each other in a language and that these contrastive units are phonemes. Having said that, let us take a look at the two, three main questions about the phoneme that we consider. Number one, what is the nature of the phoneme as an object? Now, there are at least three main ways in which the phoneme has been looked at by phoneticians and phonologists. Number one, the phoneme is considered to be a, a physical object, a physical object. Now, linguists such as Bloomfield among others considered that the phoneme is a physical object because of its acoustic properties. Daniel Jones who thought the phoneme is a family of sounds further strengthened that notion of the phoneme as a physical object. However, right from the beginning of, of <coughs> the concept, the phoneme as a physical object has come to be questioned. The person, the most important person in the field was Twaddle, who actually is the one to pr have proposed the principles of phonemic analysis. <coughs> Twaddle it is who challenged the notion of the phoneme as a physical object. Later phoneticians who have investigated the nature of phoneme have found it difficult to attest the notion that the phoneme is a physical object. For example, Bloomstein and Stevens and Stevens, the references are given for you in the learn more part of this module. The second notion of the phoneme is that it is a psychological or a mental object. The first person to have introduced the notion of the phoneme as a psychological or a mental object was Ed Edward Sapir way back in 1933 in his famous book called Language. Since then, the notion <coughs> was not accepted in the theory that was dominant in the 40s and 50s period, but it came to be accepted in the generative linguistic theory. Thus, transformational generative phonology assumes the view that the phoneme is a mental or cognitive object. The, uh, the third notion of the phoneme is that it is both a physical and cognitive object. Thus, the 
approach to phonemics called laboratory phonology assumes that the phoneme should be looked at both as a physical object as well as a cognitive object. Continuing with the investigation of the phoneme as an object, a most recent theory known as optimality theory does not think that the notion of the phoneme is relevant in any way because its main concern is with the output form of speech sounds. So now for, for the present <coughs> module and for this course we assume that the view that the phoneme is both a physical object as well as a cognitive object which be, will be held. The second important issue with regard to the phoneme is the nature of the content of the phoneme. What does a phoneme consist of? The most important notion that has come to be acceptable in phonology is the notion of distinctive features. This is a notion that has influenced not only phonology but many other areas of linguistics as well as cognitive linguistics. A distinctive feature is a phonetic feature that distinguishes speech sounds. It is assumed that there is a set, a small set of distinctive features that is used in distinguishing speech sounds of all the world languages. The notion was first introduced by the Prague school and the most important members of the school being Jakobsen and Trubetskoy. Today the theory of distinctive features is still under development but a fairly strong consensus on the theory exists. Three main critical concepts have come to be accepted in phonological theory today that relate to the notion of distinctive features. These are the term distinctive features itself and the other two terms are under specification and markedness. Let us see how these terms are understood in phonology today. Distinctive features are a set of universal features that are binary that is with plus and minus values or monovalent that is either present or absent out of which speech sounds of a specific language are made. A sound is distinguished from another sound in terms of at least one of the features. Thus, p and b are distinct from each other in the feature voice. b is plus voice and p is minus voice. This notion of under specification relates to the idea that certain segments are not fully specified for the distinctive features. These are left out because they are predictable or not contrastive. Thus, given three sounds in a language namely e, a and a all front vowels. If all these front vowels are not rounded then we assume that in giving the features of the sound these three sounds it is not necessary for us to mention the feature plus round in describing these sounds. Similarly, if a language has the sounds u, o and o and all these are back vowels and the back vowels are always rounded. Then given the feature back given the sounds back vowel or the feature plus back it is not necessary to say the feature plus round because the feature plus round is predictable from the feature plus back. And this is the notion of under specification. Uh, the third notion is that of markedness. Markedness, uh, <coughs> the theory of markedness claims that we need to distinguish between speech sounds and generalizations about speech sounds that are commonly found across world languages and, the, and speech sounds which are very uncommon. The uncommon speech sounds are considered to be marked speech sounds or a phenomenon that is uncommon a process that is uncommon is considered to be a marked process. Thus the sonorants such as lateral, nasal, trill, tap, 
tend to be voiced in most world languages. There are only a few languages in which these sounds called sonorants can be voiceless. <coughs> so, for example, l or n compared to l n, the voiceless lateral and the voiceless nasal are thus considered to be marked sounds compared to the voiced lateral and nasal l and n. Thus, distinctive features under specification and markedness. These three critical concepts have come to contribute to phonology because of the important question of the nature of the content of a phoneme. We will now consider some of the preliminary notions in phonemic analysis. In the past module, we already saw the need for phonemic analysis for various purposes such as write, developing a writing system of an unwritten language or proposing language technology solutions in the field of speech. Unless we have phonemic analysis of a language carried out, some of these problems cannot be addressed. Thus, the, there is no uh, denying the importance of phonemic analysis. Now, how do we carry out phonemic analysis? The two most important notions with which we begin uh, phonemic analysis are phonetic similarity and suspicious pairs. What is phonemic si phonetic similarity? Phonetic similarity refers mainly to the articulatory features of speech sounds. Thus, given the sounds p, p, t, and k, it is not very difficult to see that the sounds p and p are more phonetically similar to each other than the sound p and t, for example. So, p and p have the same place of articulation, one is aspirated, the other is unaspirated. The phonetic similarity is much less in the case of sounds such as p and, and l, because there is hardly anything common between the two. Now, the use of the notion of phonetic similarity in phonemic analysis is that those sounds which are phonetically entirely dissimilar cannot be suspected to be, to be members of the same phoneme, such as p and l. We do not find instances of a p changing to l in any language or the other way around. So, given two sounds p and l, we do not suspect them to members to be members of the same phoneme. But given two sounds such as p and p or p and b, we suspect that these two sounds may be members of, the of, a, uh, of one phoneme. Now, on what grounds? We have already discussed the assumption that sounds may be affected by the environments in which they occur. It, we already saw in a language like English that p occurs at the beginning of words and p occurs in some other environments. Similarly, l is velarized at the end of words or before a consonant and it is voiceless after a voiceless plosive and so on. So, these consonants which are phonetically similar can be suspected to be members of the pho same phoneme because it is possible that the difference between them is brought about by the environment. The notion of phonetic similarity is thus crucially related to the notion of suspicious pairs. In carrying out a phonemic analysis, we first make a list of suspicious pairs such as p, p, or t, d, or g, n, or s, z, or ch, s, in a language because it is commonly found that one of the sounds can change to another sound in different contexts. Once the suspicious pairs have all been collected, then it is that a phonemic analysis is carried out. We will then take a look at the principles of phonemic analysis that are, that are applied to the data consisting of suspicious pairs. Principles of phonemic analysis. 
the principles of phonemic analysis that have come to evolve in the last uh, about 70 years are those which make use of the two foundational notions uh, of structural relations proposed by Saussure for the first time. <coughs> These are the two parameters known as paradigmatic parameter of relations among sounds and the syntagmatic relation, syntagmatic parameter of relations amongst two sounds. If you recall a paradigmatic relation among two sounds consists in one substituting the other, one occupying the same place as the other. A syntagmatic relationship is found in words such as pit and pin. The vowel E is oral in the word pit because the following vowel is the following sound is a plosive consonant but the vowel is a nasal vowel because the following sound is a nasal consonant. So the relationship between a following, a following sound and the vowel this relationship is called syntagmatic relationship. In phonemic analysis we make use of both types of relationship namely paradigmatic and syntagmatic and the principles of phonemic analysis address both these relationships amongst sound, speech sounds in a system. The <coughs> conclusions about the phonemic status of two speech sounds is based on paradigmatic relationship and the conclusion about two speech sounds being members of the same phoneme or realization of the same abstract unit called phoneme is on account of the syntagmatic relationship between those sounds to their environments. Before starting with the principle of phonemic analysis we looked at the important notion of the phoneme how it arose from the notion of the phonemic principle and how two important questions in relation to the phoneme has contributed to the development of phonological theory. One about the nature of the phoneme as an object there are <coughs> there are at least three different ways in which the phoneme has been seen as an object namely as a physical object or as a cognitive object or as a combination of both physical and cognitive object and we said that in phonological theory of today the notion of the phoneme as a both a physical and a cognitive object is the one that we accept today <coughs> especially following the rise of generative phonology. We also looked at the how the notion the question of the content of the phoneme has contributed further to our understanding about the structure patterning of speech sounds three important notions namely distinctive features under specification and markedness have contributed to the growth of phonological theory we look at these notions in the later modules of this course thank you